Hello, everyone. Good morning from Manila. Welcome to today's Asia Impact webinar, which is entitled is Mobilizing Taxes for Development in Asia. My name is Yuho Miyoda. I am an economist from the Macroeconomics Research Division in ADB. And I am the moderator for today's session. Today, we will talk about domestic resource mobilization and the related issues in Asia. DRM is the process through which countries raise their domestic revenues to satisfy their expenditure needs to achieve sustainable growth in the long run. It is essential for regional economies to increase their domestic revenues and thus reduce their fiscal dependency on external aid. We will open today's session with a presentation by Tom Park. Tom is the advisor for the Strategic Knowledge Initiative in the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department at ADB. Tom has been playing a leading role in the number of issues of Asian Development Outlook, including the latest issue that focuses on DLM. Based on the latest ADO theme chapter, Tom will present the recent trends in the regional efforts to raise domestic revenues and deliver the key recommendations for the future, ex future efforts. As the time is limited, I'll hand over the floor for Tom's presentation without further delay. Please go ahead. Good morning to all distinguished panelists and webinar participants. I am Tongyan Park of ADB's research department, and I'm happy to share with you this morning the key findings from Asian Development Outlook 2022 theme chapter on mobilizing taxes for development. In 2021, thanks to strong export growth, developing Asia's economies rebounded by 6.9% compared to 5% for advanced economies, 6.7% for Latin America, 3.1% for Middle East and North Africa, and 3.5% for Sub-Saharan Africa. But moving forward, medium and long-term development will require mobilization of domestic fiscal resources, especially taxes. Public spending on education, healthcare, and social protection is lower in Asia's developing economies than in the advanced economies. The two charts show that higher spending on education and health is strongly correlated with higher tax revenues. Clearly, Improving the efficiency of public spending can help free up fiscal resources and private finance also has an important role to play. Nevertheless, mobilization of tax revenue holds the key to financing higher government spending needed to support sustainable development. This chart shows before COVID-19, the region's tax revenues increased, but remained relatively low at around 16% of GDP. That was a little below Latin America and well below OECD economies. Within the region, tax revenues of South Asia and Southeast Asia tend to be lower than other sub-regions. Generally, Asia's developing economies depend heavily on consumption taxes, especially the value-added tax, or VAT, and corporate income taxes. On the other hand, relatively little revenue is generated from personal income tax and property tax. Predictably, COVID-19 has had a negative impact on Asia's tax revenues. Based on our data, tax revenues have declined across the region, even more than during previous episodes of economic slowdown. In the coming years, it is likely that a careful fiscal consolidation 
will be required in many economies of the region. And where fiscal spending is already low, tax revenue mobilization will be all the more important as the economy recovers. If we benchmark tax revenue against each economy structure and economic activities, we find that there is a potential to increase tax revenues by three to 4% of GDP in the region. How to best mobilize tax revenues depends on econ economy specific priorities and factors. Consider tax expenditures. These are special tax concessions. For instance, tax breaks designed to attract foreign investors. As this chart shows, tax expenditures sacrifice about 14% of total tax revenues. These tax expenditures are not reported and scrutinized like other fiscal items. They're also difficult to remove and they yield hard to measure benefits. For example, surveys of foreign investors suggest that these fiscal incentives are less important than other factors in attracting foreign investment. Therefore, to better mobilize fiscal resources, tax expenditures need to be evaluated and reported more systematically. The value added tax or VAT is developing Asia's core tax revenue, but it can be better utilized. The ratio of VAT revenues to GDP is lower in developing Asia than in both Latin America and OECD countries. The region can potentially strengthen VAT through tax base broadening, including better coverage of digital commerce activities. Furthermore, as this chart shows, the standard VAT rates are on average lower in developing Asia than in Latin America and much lower than in OECD economies. Recently, we noted several VAT changes in the region. For example, Vanuatu increased VAT rate from 12.5% to 15% in 2018, and Indonesia announced VAT rate increase from 10% to 11% in 2022. This chart shows that self-employment has declined in Asia. Generally, self-employment tends to limit the earnings data needed by tax authorities. So this trend toward declining self-employment is supportive of greater personal income tax mobilization. In some economies, the personal income tax rates are set at low levels and the top marginal rates apply at very high income levels. These can be revised to boost tax revenue. Asian countries can also mobilize more property taxes by improving property valuation and coordinating more closely with local governments. As for developing Asia's corporate income taxes, the two pillar multilateral initiative under the inclusive framework is promising. This should ease the pressure of tax competition and provide greater certainty to taxpayers as well as tax administration. Beyond the core taxes, environmental taxes also have potential for the region. Some Asian economies have used environmental taxes, including fossil fuel taxes, but collected relatively little revenue from them. More recently, some economies in the region have started implementing carbon taxes and carbon emission trading schemes. But governments tend to be cautious 
due to competitiveness and distributional concerns. The chart shows that carbon tax rates and carbon tax revenues are quite low in the re region relative to other parts of the world. For carbon emission trading schemes, the permits are often distributed free of charge, which limits their revenue generation. To help address distributional effects and smooth the implementation, transfer programs like rebates to vulnerable end users may be useful for developing Asia's economies. As in other regions, the use of alcohol, tobacco, and sugar-sweetened beverages are linked with the rising incidence of non-communicable diseases. The region is also hit hard by health costs related to these products. Taxing such unhealthy products is a cost-effective way to discourage unhealthy consumption. But these health taxes remain too low. For example, this chart shows that cigarette taxes for developing Asia, the blue solid line, are much lower than cigarette taxes in advanced economies, in pink solid line. The data also suggest that the revenue from tobacco-related taxes is below the overall costs and damages associated with tobacco consumption. For developing Asia, there is potential for corrective health taxes to generate additional tax revenues of up to 0.6% of GDP. This last slide shows that several economies in developing Asia implemented successful reforms that significantly boosted tax revenues. Their experience points to the central role of political leadership and public buy-in in the success of the reforms. Timing is also important. Reforms may be more acceptable during difficult periods when the stakeholders understand the urgency of tax reform. For developing Asia, the reform of the value-added tax is often an integral part of an effective tax reform package. Broader economic reform can also make a significant contribution. For example, reducing business registration costs can help expand formal economic activities which increase the tax base for tax collection. In addition, many economies of developing Asia can benefit from increased use of technology, including information technology, as well as more human resources in their tax administration. Finally, it goes without saying that the region's governments can improve taxpayers' willingness to pay taxes by improving the quality of public spending and the quality of public services. That was the summary of the Asian Development Outlook 2022 theme chapter, Mobilizing Taxes for Development. I, no I now pass on to my colleague, Yuho Miyoda, who will moderate the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for the concise presentation. There is a great highlight of the latest theme chapter in ADO. Indeed, Asian economies are facing growing demands for public ex expenditure to achieve sustainable growth. At the same time, the specific solutions for increasing domestic revenues will be different for each economy, depending on the economic and social context. If any of you are interested in more detailed discussions, I recommend visiting our website and downloading the latest issue of the ADO theme chapter. Now, let us welcome our panelists today. 
and discuss the related concerns that may be important to consider in finding practical solutions. We have three panelists today. Our first panelist is Dr. Hanarore Nisten, a researcher from the Faculty of Law at Maastricht University. Dr. Nisten is a legal and fiscal policy expert in international and European taxation. Hanarore has provided consultancy services to World Bank Group, ADB, and the International Center for Tax and Development. Her advisory experience is focused on the, the interface between tax law and policy issues with emphasis on the business involvement, digital economy, and gender. Previously, Hannah Rolle practiced tax law at the Brussels-based law firm and was a Fulbright postdoctoral scholar at Georgetown Law School and the University of Florida, specializing in comparative international fiscal policy. Hannah Rolle holds a PhD in law from Maastricht University. Our second panelist is Sanjay Grover, Senior Public Private Partnership Specialist at ADB. Mr. Grover has an extensive experience in PPP within and outside ADB. In the current position, Sanjay is leading the Creating Investable Cities Initiative to help cities in climate changes and improve their opportunities for private sector financing. Through his previous roles, he also acted as an advisor to local governments in the United States, Latin America, and Asia, and as an equity investor in municipal infrastructure projects. He holds MBA from MIT Sloan and a master's degrees in city planning and transport from Georgia Tech University. Uh, Sanjay provides the perspectives of local government financing and private sector financing for public demands in today's session. Our third panelist is Marcel Schroeder, economist at ADB. Dr. Schroeder is a development economist with a strong interest in policy-oriented research centered around macroeconomic aspects of economic development, especially the development of resource-intensive economies. He hosts a PhD in economics from Australian National University. In today's session, he will share the challenges and the resource intensive economies, uh, economies face in raising domestic revenues and their potential solutions. Thank you for joining today's session, Hannah Rolle, Sinjai, and Musal. Well, before diving into the discussion, as a reminder for the audience, please type your questions in the chat box with the name of the panelist you'd like to direct your question to. Tom is also here if any of you want to ask a question about his presentation. Um, well, waiting for the questions from the floor, let me open up a discussion with a general, general question to all panelists. Well, Tom has walked through the general principles that apply to many economies to mobilize domestic revenue sufficiently, and those are obviously of primary importance, but as he also highlighted in the presentation, um, the economies might face different challenges depending on their econ economic and social backgrounds when they are to raise more revenues. So to all, all our panelists, what sort of challenges do you observe the economies are facing in increasing domestic revenues and how those challenges could, be, could undermine their efforts for independent financing? I'll start with Malfil, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Yuho, for uh, the question. Um, yeah, I'm going to focus mostly on the resource-rich uh, economies and um, on fiscal resource revenues. Uh, I mean, there are uh, several challenges. Um, the number one is uh, to note that uh, many of these economies um, tend to be in the low or low middle income group. So uh, naturally, their institutional capacity is uh, quite limited. Um, and uh, I would say this is uh, perhaps the, one of the greatest challenges um, of, uh, from several uh, uh, angles. Uh, the first one is to um, make sure that uh, they get uh, good deals when they uh, negotiate with um, 
powerful uh, multinational uh, corporations that often um, yeah, extract these uh, natural resources. Um, that would be a key challenge. And the second is once um, the uh, resource projects uh, actually start that, uh, yeah, the administration and um, tax collection uh, basically is, is a second challenge. And uh, it basically, yeah, it, it, it comes down to the uh, institutional capacity and, and strengthening that, I would say, would be um, yeah, a key challenge that uh, these um, resource-rich developing economies need to address. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, what do you think, Anna Rore? Thank you, uh, Yuho. Thank you, uh, Dong, for the presentation. Uh, so I will actually zoom in on gender equality and taxation which was actually only partly addressed in the presentation from Dong, uh, focusing when he addressed uh, tech, uh, public spending and public e expenditures. So the path to successful DRM starts, in my view, with the political commitment to reducing inequality and particularly gender inequality. Tech systems and policies in the Asia-Pacific region contribute to or hinder gen gender equality in several socioeconomic dimensions, including labor force participation, income, and the distribution of households and unpaid care. Gender inequality results in an over-reliance on a narrow tax base consisting of a few wealthy individuals and corporations. For instance, improving the collection of personal income taxation, which was also addressed by Doom, faces structural and technical challenges. An example is the large informal sector. The tax mainly falls on formal sector rich income, while most capital income and informal workforce largely escapes the income tax net. As a result, women in the Asia Pacific region falls often outside the individual income tax net. Another example is that secondary earners, mostly women, may be subject to a higher tax rate because of how joint filing and various household tax credits work. Evidence exists that joint taxation results in that some married women out of the labor force, particularly with married female, females more likely than male to be secondary earners. So, Focusing on gender equality and taxation, there are some issues to address from the DRM uh, perspective. That's from the revenue perspective. If we go to the uh, public spending, um, we have to recognize that the tax share in developing economies in the Asia Pacific region remains lower than is necessary to support adequate public goods and services. And this can be attributed to both limited redistribution for taxes owing to weak personal income tax and property tax revenues. The combination of low revenue shares and generally prudent debt accumulation constrains public spending, including that for social safety nets and social ins insurance, besides other public goods and services such as education and medical services, that could empower women. And I will stop here and I will hand over the floor to the next panelist. Thank you, Hannah Rolle. Um, Sanjay? Uh, first, thank you so much to ERCD for hosting this event and for inviting us here. And now after hearing Marcel and Hannah Laura, I actually look forward to hearing more of what they have to share. Uh, my focus, as you mentioned, is I lead a program called Creating Investable Cities. And yeah. my focus is much more on subnational local revenue mobilization. Uh, and here the challenge is, I mean, just, just to give some background, uh, local revenue mobilization at the subnational level happens through three aspects mainly the intergovernmental transfers through own source revenue, which is property yeah. taxes and user charges, as well as through borrowings. Uh, and here the credit worthiness of a city becomes important. And 
without getting into the complex area of intergovernmental transfers, uh, which is uh, quite a world unto itself, and considering the challenges that we, our cities are facing right now, especially with COVID and coming out of COVID uh, as we start our recovery, I would say the biggest challenges facing our local governments go into improving our own source revenue uh, and improving our credit worthiness. And I think both of these are really critical elements if our cities have to meet the sustainable development goals, including what Anilor was just pointing out about gender. Uh, but I think the barriers to these challenges are coming down and I think there are substantial opportunities for us as ADB to be able to support local governments. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Sinjay. Um, if I may, I let me ask a few question, following up questions for each of the panelists. Um, uh, first, I'll turn to Marcel. Uh, you've mentioned the, the, the greatest challenge for the developing Asian economies is that uh, weak institutions in their, in their countries. How do you think they can improve the institutions to strengthen the fiscal um, capacity in their country? Well, you know, that's uh, obviously a very um, long-term process uh, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, th yeah, th there must be a continuous um, effort and, and, and plan uh, be put in place. And um, I, I would say uh, in, the me in, in the short and medium term until uh, these institutions uh, strengthen, uh, I think um, the key to address the challenge is actually to um, sort of uh, circumvent uh, uh, that and, and, and focus um, on, on different um, revenue streams uh, by these economies. Um, this is one of the um, yeah, recommendations that uh, our research makes uh, uh, in, 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 in this area. Uh, so for, for the let's say low income group of resource rich developing countries, it does perhaps make sense uh, in some circumstances to actually not uh, go for revenue maximization, but instead um, yeah, focus on more stable revenues that are easier to collect. Uh, for example, what we have in mind is that uh, when, when we take the um, corporate income tax, uh, that's quite difficult to administer because uh, there are so many exemptions and there are different ways to um, obviously calculate uh, the uh, profits of the multinationals and they have a much better team of accountants and uh, they know all the uh, international law, um, which uh, host countries often uh, might find difficult to deal with. And um, for this reason, it could be uh, easier to perhaps focus more on, um, yeah, just a, a royalty type of payment or a fixed um, amount uh, per year, uh, basically just to, to stabilize uh, uh, the revenue streams uh, from the resources. So this might go uh, perhaps uh, against uh, the idea of, well, how can um, resource-rich countries uh, uh, generate more revenues? But the idea is that um, over time, since these uh, resource projects um, uh, uh, operate over many decades, uh, uh, I mean, it depends on the project, right? But the idea is that to really uh, create a more stable revenue stream, because there are also uh, implications for macroeconomic stability uh, if um, yeah, the revenues are stabilized. So I'll stop here and perhaps can uh, talk more about the macroeconomic stability aspect at the uh, uh, later stage. Thank you, Marcel. I, I will definitely turn back again for again to you for the macroeconomics later. But uh, we see a lot of questions that are already popping up in the chat box. And then as uh, Marcel mentioned, the, the difficulties in taxing those multinational uh, corporations. I'll take the 
a question from Mylin. It's asking about the, the implications of international corporations against uh, BEPS for Asian developing economies. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Hannah Rore? Yes, uh, th- thanks for this question. So with, with regards to the rise of the digital economy, especially in developing Asia, um, it exacerbates corporate income tax avoidance, uh, motivated by a desire to attract internationally mobile capital and maintenance of competent, competitiveness. Um, like governance uh, are looking at how to tax this rising digital economy. And with regards to the inclusive framework uh, that the OECD is developing in collaboration with the G20, this will have implications for international corporations. And as you all know, the the new inclusive framework exists of two pillars. One is the revisiting of the allocation of uh, taxing rights. And the second pillar is um, more it will have more implications for international corporations in the sense that it will be subject most companies um, under um, 15 percent corporate global minimum tax so the main implication that i see for governance and um, international corporations is that it may negate the benefit of tax incentives offered by countries uh, especially to foreign investors in the in uh, in the ICT sector, um, the IMF and uh, in collaboration also with the OCD uh, calculated the revenues from this pillar two, the global minimum tax, and it would be small. Uh, the small revenue, I I quickly check here, um, it would only. Um, yeah, very modest tax revenues, but the main implication will be this negation of the tax expenditures in order to, to be subject to this 50% top-up global minimum tax. Thank you, Hannah Rolle. It's, it's very interesting to hear about this uh, uh, timely topic from you. Um, let's move on to another question in the chat box. Um, uh, I'll pick uh, one from... Hannah Jaber. Um, the question is, how do you think ADB can support the local government's efforts to diversify and strengthen their financing? I guess this one goes to Sanjay. Please go ahead. Uh, no, thank, thank you for this question. And Hannah, you know, even since the start of COVID, we've seen, I was just talking to you about the barriers that we see, uh, which is about increasing own source revenue for cities. Uh, as well as about improving the credit worthiness. And since since the start of COVID, even within the region, we are starting to see a lot of countries remove some of the political obstacles that exist to decentralization. And Mongolia, for example, is asking Ulan Bhattar to do more. Same in Vietnam, a lot, so much more in India, where the 15th Finance Commission is actually pushing decentralization as one of the bigger aspects going forward. So we are seeing a lot of demand from our member countries to be able to increase our support at the subnational level. And I think ADB has a phenomenal role to play here, both because of the one ADB structure that we have. I mean, not just on the funding side in terms of helping governments think through their own source revenue mobilization aspects, both through property taxes, or through user charges and improving cost recovery, but also on the financing side, in terms of being able to support subnationals through a non-sovereign windows uh, as we push the climate agenda forward. And uh, so I, I think there are quite a few areas where we could actually come in and support. And as Marcel pointed out, the biggest challenge at the subnational level remains capacity. Uh, capacity to do both the funding side better and the financing side better. And here we have a lot of resources within ADB uh, under this, the current presidency and our focus on domestic resource mobilization. We have the Asia Pacific Tax Hub, uh, which focuses on property taxes and uh, is being led by Sandeep, who is a, I, I know here as well, uh, and uh, the governance thematic group 
and uh, under creating investable cities, we are working both again on the funding side and the financing side. And uh, it's terrific to see that a lot of ADB, a lot of groups around ADB are focusing in on this area, including urban, climate, uh, finance, uh, governance as well. And to be able to help improve the credit worthiness of cities across Asia. Uh, so, so I think that there are a lot of areas where ADB can actually support on both of these, the funding and the financing. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Tom, do you want to add something onto that Sanjay's comment? Yes, sure. Thanks, uh, Yuho. I think an important source of revenues, right, of tax revenues for local governments and sub national government is in fact property taxes. And what is uh, limit, limiting property taxes, which are very much underutilized in the region is proper valuation, proper market valuation of properties. And I think uh, that has to do with a lot of uh, political economy factors. So I think governance reform, uh, of the governments, especially at the uh, subnational government uh, level, is actually very important for mobilizing more tax revenues at the uh, subnational and local government level. Back to you, Yuho. Thank you, Tom. Indeed, it's very much important to strengthen the tax capacity in the subnational government level, especially, I mean, as you mentioned in the presentation, property tax is one of the important resources for those developing. Uh, Asian economies. Um, well, now let's turn back to Hannah Rowley. Uh, there is a well, popular question. Uh, sure, sure. Go ahead, Sanjay. Please. point to Mr. Park, and I take his point absolutely. Uh, and it's not just the tax rates, and I think those have the property valuation had to come up. I think technology is moving fast enough ahead for us to be able to remove the barriers to be able to push property tax collections forward, uh, including the collection aspect of it. It's both the tax rate and the collections and making those more streamlined and better will actually help. And so we do see a lot of opportunities in this area as we go forward. Thank you. I just thought I, it was an apt time to follow up on Mr. Park. Thank you for your response, Sanjay. Um, Hannah Rore, do you want to add another comment on this topic? Uh, yes. So actually, I recognize the importance of property taxation to strengthen, and this could be one of the potential um, new efforts to, to focus on besides personal income tax. Uh, two remarks. I think that the tax system uh, needs to be in line with a proper uh, registering property cadaster and mapping of the properties. So we, in order to to have a proper property tax that is often absent in many countries. Um, we have to, um, to have a mapping of all the properties uh, in order to levy taxes. So I think this is uh, very important uh, to, to strengthen the capacity um, on, on mapping properties. And secondly, if I put this in the context of gender equality and gender inequality, we have to recognize that women in many countries hold less than 10% of properties. So we could think to have like to, to put the efforts on property taxes with potential incentives for women to encourage them to buy and, and purchase properties. So this is an important um, line to, to, to keep in mind that we should Think about how can we use property taxes to encourage women to, to own assets as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Roy. Um, we got a very popular question in the chat box. I think that one also goes to Hannah Rowley. Um, that's from Edith. Um, it's asking about, uh, given the immediate need for, needs to raise revenues, what do you see, see as the main challenges in bringing a gender dimension to the tax work in Asia and Pacific? Please go ahead, Hannah Roy. Uh, thank you. So the main challenges in bringing a, a gender equality perspective is, I believe, is the lack of data. So um, we, we have not done a lot of research on, on the bridge between gender equality and taxation 
in developing countries and also in Asia Pacific. So um, ADB is focusing on, on this on this research with doing a very innovative uh, research where we look at tax provisions in order to get a stock taking and an overview. And we do a legal review where we look at tax provisions on the one hand, tax provisions that exacerbate gender inequality and on the other hand, tax provisions that promote gender inequality. With this first research and it's um, led by the ADB, we try to address the lack of knowledge um, and to fill this knowledge gap. Also, it's very important, in my view, to build tools to assess the incidence and dynamic behavioral responses, especially to detect and assess gender biases in the tax legislation where there is no explicit reference to gender but with gender neutral tax provisions, but that can still exacerbate gender inequality. So in conclusion, I believe we should put our efforts first in order to get an overview of the tax legislation, because it all starts with the legislation, where are biases, but also where are provisions that promote gender inequality. Once we get this overview, we uh, will provide technical support to countries um, individually in order to see where are improvements possible. Thank you, Hannah Roy. Um, um, let's get to another question. It's from Novo Bangsal. Um, this is for Melcel. Uh, the, the question says, average tax effort tax to GDP ratio in case of Philippines has rarely breached 15% even during non-crisis period. Fiscal consolidation with reduced expenditure is currently being pursued by authorities to trim fiscal deficits. With less robust growth prospects in the region, what do you think is the best path forward to achieve higher tax efforts while recovery efforts are still ongoing? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, again, I, I'll just uh, I will focus on the uh, fiscal resource revenues and uh, perhaps uh, uh, not just focus on the Philippines, but uh, yeah, it, make a few general remarks. So perhaps what um, makes uh, fiscal resource revenues uh, so uh, unique um, is that the government actually wants uh, these resource projects are underway and um, the deals are made with the multinationals. So perhaps uh, to, to clarify this, uh, before um, these resource projects take off, typically it will uh, sit down and they negotiate and finally, they agree on the fiscal regime of the uh, resource project. Uh, of course, for the smaller um, resource projects, there's a standard fiscal regime in place. Uh, but for the bigger ones, uh, which I want to focus on here, where most of the revenues come from, um, there is actually little room for governments later to renegotiate because that would hurt uh, their uh, reputation and um, potentially they could miss out on uh, yeah future resource projects uh, since it would scare off um, some of these multinationals right when the government constantly tries to renegotiate so it is basically um, the decisions are made uh, uh, a priori uh, in many ways and um, then, uh, uh, yeah, the revenues are basically a function of what negotiated, and it's independent of um, the current state of the economy, what the commodity prices are. Um, it, it is basically, it has to be taken as given, right? And, and um, that's uh, important uh, to, to keep in mind. And I guess this is different from other revenues such as VAT or property taxes that were mentioned. Um, later the, the government in in these cases can actually adjust uh and and fine-tune at the later stage uh to their needs and 
uh, yeah, when there is an economic downturn, there there can be um, uh, the government can pursue perhaps a different strategy. But in the case of fiscal resource revenues, that's uh, not so simple. So uh, yeah, for these other revenues, perhaps I can uh, pass over to Sanjay Hanelori or uh, Tom to discuss those more. Thank you, Monsel. Uh, uh, does anyone want to jump in that, that on the call for, from Marcel? Maybe Tom or Sanjay or Hanarole? Oh, can you repeat the question very quickly? Uh, Tom, it's basically um, with, with less robust growth prospects in the region, How what is the best path forward to um, uh, get a better tax effort? So this uh, refers to, uh, I focus on the uh, fiscal resource revenues um, and, and uh, yeah, I guess the, the question is uh, generally about uh, tax revenues, how these can be um, uh, increased during an economic downturn, as we're seeing now. Okay. No, I think I think you're absolutely right. But I, but I think we have to be careful about uh, predicting Asia's medium and long-term growth prospects from the last couple of years, which have been very very unusual. So I do think uh, Asian governments do need to be very careful about uh, mobilizing more taxes or to put it bluntly, raising taxes in this kind of uncertain and fragile growth environment. But I think looking beyond the short term and as economies recover, although of course the, the speed and magnitude of recovery will differ from country to country, I do think this uh, greater tax revenue mobilization, and and it it has to be a balanced effort. Of course, uh, of course, they have to try to raise more from their mainstay, such as VAT, but also venture into new areas, such as property tax, personal income tax, digital economy tax, environmental tax, health tax, and so forth. It has to be a balance. So I do think it has to be a medium-term strategy and priority, strategic priority for most governments in the region. Yeah, back to you, Yuho. Thank you, Tom, for your comments on that. And you, I saw the hands up from uh, Sanjay, please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Yuho. And, and further to follow up again uh, from everything that Marcel and uh, Mr. Park just said, I, I think there is a growing awareness after COVID especially of the importance of improving service delivery at the local levels. And there is a willingness of people to pay more for it. Or, and and that, that I think, uh, especially for things like carbon finance, I mean, carbon taxes is a way for uh, the local governments to be able to do more, to be able to uh, there is an awareness or the need to be able to push this. The political challenges related to this are coming down. We're noting, not, noticing this in India as well. Uh, there's the ease of living aspect that's happening in India as well. Again, trying to push on the subnationals to be able to deliver better services. So if we can improve the capacity of the local governments, if we can improve the service delivery, people will pay more. Uh, for resilient infrastructure, for uh, climate-related issues. Uh, and, and, and I think those may be, continue to be opportunities. Uh, property taxes, again, is still the elephant in the room that we need to do a lot more on. And with technology, I think that's another area that we could make a dent on as we move forward and stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, Hannah Roy, do you want to add some comments on that? Yes, uh, thank you. You. Um, so I actually see on the one hand tax policy. For tax policy, I see three main focus points. On the one hand, uh, of first, it's VID, where I see room to improve uh, the efforts in order to tax the digital economy. Secondly, uh, personal income taxation and property taxation, because the tax revenues in Asia Pacific regions are very low. Uh, with regards to per, per, personal income tax and property taxation. And thirdly, I see room for strengthening environmental taxes. Um, and this is because environmental taxes as of today are not in its full potential. 
So that's for the tax policy side. On the other hand, you have the tax administration, and I see their room to focus on a better tax compliance, especially for multinational companies, in order to combat tax avoidance and tax evasion. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Rolle. Uh, well, we see a lot more questions in the chat box, and um, but I believe some of them are related to how can those uh, economies hit by the COVID-19 can ensure the recovery pass after the uh, after the crisis. Okay. You ho, you ho. I have yes. one thing to add. Okay, go ahead, Tom. The tax administration is certainly very important, but I think we have to be careful about one thing: technology, right? So, in particular, information and communication technology (ICT) can do a lot to help tax help, to help improve the quality of tax administration. At the same time, we cannot assume that IT is a panacea for tax administration. In particular, it's a complement. You have to have good governance. Without good governance, IT and, the, and technology will do only so much uh, for tax administration. I think that's a, a point that should be uh, understood in developing countries. Yeah, back to you, Mi, uh, Yuho. Thank you. Uh, we've been talking about uh, how to strengthen the fiscal capacity amid the recovery process from the COVID-19 shock. And then uh, some some of the uh, the audience I'm questioning about, I mean, they're a little cautious about taxing more on the economy. Uh, one of them is like, uh, uh, how do you assure the higher tax rates will not lead to more rampant illicit trade of these same products and results to larger Revenue for gold. Um, in a broader term, um, how can we ensure that the higher tax rate or uh, new taxes on the, the new products uh, uh, will not uh, uh, dampen the economy and the, end up with the lower tax revenue as a whole? Uh, does anyone have comment on that question? Probably Tom. Yeah, I think, I think, again, I think it's a matter of striking balance. On the one hand, we don't want to discourage or deter innovation, right? Especially in digital economy, especially when digital economy is very big in Asia and Asia is home to many of the world's biggest digital economy corporations. On the other hand, we don't want to discriminate tax-wise in, in favor of digital firms versus non-digital firms. But I think this is something where things are still very much fluid. And uh, as we get, gather more knowledge, gain more knowledge and experience and, and policymakers too, uh, I think we can strike that balance much better. And then we will uh, collect sufficient revenues from this growing digital economy sector without, without uh, discouraging continuous uh, innovation and dynamism. Back to you. You home. Thank you, Tom. Um, there's another question from Shimus. Uh, that's asking about uh, how how uh, subnational governments correct revenues, and uh, uh, do you see the relative contribution of other fees and charges? Uh, do you want to answer this question, Sanjay? Uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, this, this is an interesting question, and and here, if I may also point out that. At ADB, we are just launching the subnational financing monitor, which dives uh, and this focus. The subnational finances are slightly under researched, in, in my opinion, uh, in, in Asia. And here we are launching the subnational financing monitor, which uh, will look at around 12 countries and provide an in depth analysis of the legal, political, and institutional context within which subnational finances happen but also a thorough scan of the existing revenue structures which are available to these cities or, or to the subnationals as they go forward. We hope to be able to use this to be able to work with cities across, uh, subnationals across Asia, both from a policy effort, but also as a part of our effort to be able to provide them advisory service as to how exactly could they bring in climate into the budgets, bring in gender into the budgets, uh, how, how can they actually improve 
other alternative revenue streams as they go forward, both as an opportunity for us to increase property taxes, which is a part of it, but also other taxes to be able to push the climate agenda forward. Thank you, Yu. Thank you, Sanjay, for the great answer to the question. Well, there are so many more questions in the chat box. It's a pity that we couldn't answer all of the questions, but uh, if you don't mind, uh, please reach out to us via email and then we can pass on those questions to any of the panelists after this webinar. Um, thank you, Hannah Rolle, Sanjay and Melsal for their great discussion. Uh, it showcased how various social and economic issues could be related to the efforts for domestic crisis mobilization. Um, we have ongoing technical assistance projects in DLM that is supposed to cover those broader range of issues, but it's not even limited to the revenue side efforts. And we are looking forward to deliver the contributions by the project in the near future. Um, before closing this webinar, let me inform you of the next Asian Impact webinar coming on 23rd of June, uh, 10 a.m. Manila time. Uh, it is entitled as Recent Technological Advances in ACM Plus 3 Financial Markets Infrastructure. Thank you again, all the panelists and the participants. I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Goodbye to you all.